This airplane here that says Boeing on it is what we're going to talk about next. It's kind of near and dear to me because I just retired from Boeing. I know a lot about it and it's really important. This is another one of the really important planes in, in all of what we've got now in aviation. It has a crazy name, it's called the Boeing 367 Model 80, and the reason it has such a weird name is that Boeing did not want anybody to know they were working on a new design, a new jet design, when they started. So they took a model number that was already in uh, production and just added a suffix after it, the various models as they developed through the design process and got up to 80 iterations before they went in to build this one. See, now here's how the story works. In 1952, the Boeing Board of Directors was meeting in Washington State, Seattle, like they always did, to decide how to spend their money and their time for the next year. And at that meeting, they realized there were two business opportunities that were so important that they had to do something about them starting right now. And the first one was a military need. In 1952, Boeing was delivering the swept-wing jet bomber called the B-47 Stratojet with six jet engines, swept wings, long-range high-speed bomber. And the mission of that aircraft was to load up with nuclear weapons and be on alert in the northern states of the United States, ready at a moment's notice to take off and fly across Canada, across the Arctic, and into the Soviet Union to deliver those weapons. That's what its mission was. That's a long airplane ride. So I bet it comes as no surprise to you that an airplane like that with first generation jet engines which used lots of gas, lots of jet fuel, uh, needed air refueling. Well, the Air Force had some planes they said were tankers, but they were based on the B-29. Now, the problem with here was compatibility. Here you've got an airplane that pretty much looks like the B-29. It had a different fuselage, but the wing and engines and everything were the same, called the KC-97. It would be up here going as fast as it could go. The receiver airplane, the jet bomber, would come up here and he had to fly as slow as he could go to stay in formation with it. And with the transfer of every thousand pounds of fuel from the tanker to the receiver, the problem for the receiver got worse. I mean, it was really ugly. So they actually had a deep refuel and a descent and everything to have enough power on the tanker to get the speeds they needed, you see. Okay, well, that's not good. So they thought, if we have the technology to make the swept wing jet bomber, the B-47, we certainly have the technology to build a compatible tanker. And we're going to do it. And we're going to start today. Okay. So then, the next idea that they found at that meeting that was uh, demanding their attention was in commercial aviation. Now, every one of you may have had a heart stoppage, just as I said those words. You say, Boeing, commercial, but of course not so fast. Do you realize that the total number of commercial airplanes that Boeing had built from day one in 1914 until the early 1950s was 66? You can build that many in a month now. They were not ever in commercial aviation. Here's an example for you. See that silver plane right there with the four propellers on it? That's a Boeing commercial transport. It's called a Boeing 307. You know how many of them they made? Ten! Well, not many. They just weren't in commercial aviation. Now, that's different today, I hope you know. <laughs> but they weren't in it. So they thought, let's try to enter the commercial aviation business now that World War II is over. Because there are three other countries that have already done it. The UK. The Brits had the de Havilland uh, uh, Comet. The mm -hmm. Comet. Comet 4, yeah. They were flying it and crashing it. Remember? Okay. The Soviets did something they were found to be typical, really, for them. They took a bomber and put seats in it and called it an airliner. TU 104, it was called. All right. And the Canadians had fully designed and flown. A twin-engine, swept-wing, jet transport plane called the Avro C-102. Your plane's made in Canada. Okay? Perfect. You know, they had it. Now, strangely, as the politics of 
big business goes, it never went into production. But they had it, see? They had even flown Americans in it, like dignitaries, you know? So Boeing thought, if we have the technology to build a swept wing jet bomber, you bet that we could have the technology to build a swept wing passenger plane, and we're going to do it. And at that meeting, they set aside $16 million, which was more valuable then, uh, then than it is now. With that money, they built one and only one airplane, that one right there. And after its first flight, two years later in 1954, that plane served as the one and only flying laboratory or flying test bed for every single part that went to make the now famous and still flying KC-135 tanker, 5,000 hours flying it, me, right here, and the equally uh, impressive Boeing 707 airliner, which is clearly the airplane that led the traveling public into the jet age. There is no doubt in the world about that. In fact, that plane was so good that it was chosen by the Air Force, by the uh, United States government to, to serve as Air Force One for 30 years. 30 years. And then they got their 747. So you see, this is kind of an important airplane. And I think it's one of the really important airplanes that we have. Any questions about that? Do you fly the KC-135 out of Pease Air Force Base? No, but I've been through there. I've landed there once, probably. Yeah. Did, did this one do the barrel roll? Yeah, two times. The man said, is this the one that did the barrel roll? Yes, it did. In, in its flight test program, it, it uh, came down over a, a, a social event, that, or actually the Boeing was holding for its CEOs of airlines that were out on a yacht for the occasion of the Gold Cup hydroplane races on some Sunday afternoon. This plane was up doing a test flight when it was over. It had three people on it, pilot, co-pilot, and a flight test engineer slash photographer. They dropped down to 800 feet, come roaring over the, the Puget Sound there, up upon this yacht, pulled the nose up and did this great big lazy barrel roll. Plane. That plane right there. Then they went out, turned around, and came back and did it again. Yep. Definitely broke off. How many passengers? Okay, well, let's, let's work that a little slowly. This is a prototype for the Boeing 707 and the KC 135, okay? It basically wasn't, this one was never made to carry people. You see, it had all kinds of engineering stuff in the back, recorders various movable weight things like huge water tanks and stuff that they could move with the center of gravity around, all the stuff you find in a test plane. But it was to test every single piece that went in to build the passenger carrying Boeing 707, which carried lots, you know, depending on its various iterations as it got bigger and longer over the years. Uh, I don't know the maximum passenger load of a 707, but it's probably about 200. There. All right. 